He might actually be the most derivative one of all. I mean, Christ, the same house. Maybe so. But you forgot the first rule of surviving a stab movie. Never answer the- I'm bored. Wait! And welcome back to Horror Queers. We're talking keep clean during your menstrual cycle. We're talking psycho homages. And we're talking, Paul, there's someone in the fucking room. And I'm Joe. And I'm Trace. And we're talking uh, what I believe to be the scariest and actually only scary entry in the Friday the 13th franchise. Oh my. Friday the 13th part two, everybody. Because uh, what's Friday, Joe? It's another Friday the 13th. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> but the October version, like, how often does this ever happen? Very rarely, right? Um, and I'm really happy to be talking about this one, because what we've done, we've done Jason X, we've done mm -hmm. Part 7, and we've done yep. Part 6. Uh, no, I think we've done Part 4. No, we have definitely not done Part 4. <laughs> God damn it. Uh, technically, we have also done the original, but only as a Patreon mini-sode. Oh, yeah. That was those early pandemic days when we were looking for content. <laughs> um, yeah, no. Um, I know that you are not big on this franchise, Joe, so I'm curious, before we uh, get really into it, what are your overall thoughts on this film? So I ended up really, really liking this on a rewatch. It mm. was interesting because I, I had seen it before. I knew that I couldn't remember the last time I had seen it, but it had been quite a while. And when I logged it on Letterboxd, my original score for this was a three, mm -hmm. which is ridiculously lowballed. And I ended up moving this up to a four and a half. Oh, wow. That's even higher than I, 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 the highest ranking I've given to a Friday film is a four star rating. But curious, is that on a Friday the 13th scale for you? Or like, is that like, no, this is a four and a half star film for me? It's more of a Friday scale, but it's mm -hmm. also, I think, probably the most accomplished film in the franchise. I would agree with that. But OK, we, we've gone too far. Let's yes. bring in our guest who's <laughs> waiting in the wings. <laughs> Everyone, he is the host of The Evolution of Horror, a weekly podcast that explores the history of the horror genre by delving into particular subgenres across several weeks, discussing a particular film in depth to look at its place within a subgenre and its impact and legacy on cinema history. Please welcome the wonderful Mike Munzer. Hello. Ooh, Thank you hello. so much for having me. Happy Friday the 13th. Yes, yes. Yes. I'm curious, Mike. So same question that I asked Joe. What is your relationship with this film? Like, when did you first see this movie? I think Friday the 13th was one of those early, early franchises for me. I, I, I expect it is for so many of us, right? Mm -hmm. uh, horror fans of a certain age or generation. I think when I started falling in love with horror, I was around 13, 14 years old. And, and it was Scream, really, that kind of like right. sparked my yeah. love of the genre. And as I'm sure you guys know, so many people have that same thing where once you discover Scream, you subsequently discover all these other slasher movies because of the references in Scream, yeah. right? So I remember... <laughs> Seeing and falling in love with Scream and then being like, oh, what's this movie Halloween they're talking about? What's this Nightmare on Elm Street they're talking about? And of course, Friday the 13th. So mm -hmm. I spent the next like year of my life just like devouring 80s slashers mo uh, slasher movies, it feels yes. like. so. And Friday the 13th was very much part of that. I don't think I watched them in order. I think, you know, my local video store only had certain movies from the franchise. Mm -hmm. I think I actually came to part two later than I came to Jason Takes Manhattan, for example. Oh, okay. Oh, wow. So, yeah, I sort of watched them all out of order, but generally, I have a lot of fun with these movies. I, I think, I don't know, they're good for a certain type of horror viewing, aren't they? I, I love, you know, sitting with some friends, cracking open a beer, mm -hmm. like watching something a little bit brainless and fun. It's mm -hmm. not going to give me the visceral scares of something like the original Halloween, for example, but it's they're, they're, they're always a fun time. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. It's a thing where, I mean, like, this is very much like, I don't know if I want to call it comfort horror, but this is easy watching horror yeah. for me. So when it comes to, like, ranking these films, I, I have two and six in my top spots. But again, like, which one is in the top? It kind of depends on my mood. I think this is actually one of the better directed films in the yes. franchise. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. I think that six is one of the more cleverly written films in the franchise. So again, depending on my mood... Um, I don't know when I saw this. I actually have... So, I've talked in this podcast before about how, like, when I was younger, I wasn't able to watch R-rated movies. My dad would frequently just tell me the plots of movies and tell me what happened in them. This was one that he did a lot because this was 
if not the first date, it's one of the first dates he went on with my mother back in Aww. 1981. Oh, nice. And my mother doesn't like horror movies. And <laughs> so it was very much like, oh, she she was doing this to like uh, to, to kind of show how brave uh, she was to me. But the, the thing that he always told me was the girl pees under the bed. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And it was the it's the only time I can remember, honestly, of any film of a character getting so scared they piss themselves. Um, well, I'm sorry. A final girl getting so scared that she pissed herself while hiding from the killer. Yeah, Mm -hmm. yeah, for sure. And I think one of the big reasons this film is such a favorite is that final girl too, right? Like I know that she's she's generally, she's a fan favorite character, isn't she, I think? Oh, yeah. Very much so. Jenny is a powerhouse of a final girl, which is interesting though, because she doesn't really have much to do in this movie until that final stretch of the film. But... Well, I actually do think a lot of this is just kind of, oh, we're just doing more of the same of the first movie. Mm -hmm. It is that final 20, 25 minutes that I think really elevates this film to to another level. Yeah, I would agree with that. And and I think that it's the same for me in as in part one, actually. I, I, yeah, I think like for me that film goes up a notch when Mrs. Voorhees enters like oh, enters yeah, the scenario, right. right? And I love the final act of the original with Mrs. Voorhees. Th- these movies do kind of slightly lag in the middle sometimes for me, you know? Like there's always that mm-hmm. period in a Friday the thirteenth movie where you've got a scary opening sequence, then you introduce to all your characters, and then it's just like them playing board games or whatever for like a significant <laughs> chunk of the movie before yes. the horror kicks in you know yeah i think that a big part of that too is how enjoyable these characters are to spend time with absolutely. and absolutely i don't really have that affinity for the characters in the first movie but i do actually like pretty much every single character in this moon mm. yeah that was going to be my response as well i think the movies often end up playing in the shallow end in terms of characterization but Mm -hmm. this film feels like it's doing a fairly decent job with at least four other of these supporting characters like i think we're doing really good work with vicky and mark Mm -hmm. and to a lesser degree scott and terry and then you know who could fucking care about sandra and whatever that guy's name is jeff Jeff. (laughs) (laughs) those are the kinds of characters that i expect to see in a friday the 13th where they are just walking body bags for jason to murder But I think this film does a fairly decent job of having some interesting characters that can pad the runtime until we finally get to Ginny. Well, and let's be clear. um, If you take away the cold open of this movie, which includes a five minute long recap of the climax of the first film, um, the movie proper is 70 minutes long. (laughs) Mm -hmm. (laughs) Short and sweet. Get to that future runtime, baby. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, but I will say that I do as as annoying as that recap is for taking so much of the runtime. I also kind of appreciate it. Like it doesn't it doesn't seem that far gone from what the Saw franchise would be doing like 20, 30, oh God, 20, 30 years later. Well, that and let's never forget that at the time that these films were coming out, VHS was barely a thing. So there were a lot of people who if you either hadn't seen the first film or you hadn't seen it in a long time, like i.e. a year or two then you needed that refresher because what the fuck happened in the last film? Yeah, yeah that's a really good point. I do love, though, that they decide to do it via a dream, right, yes. Alice? So Ooh. in amongst these flashbacks, you just get Alice going, ah, ah, and just, like, t- tossing and turning in her bed for, like, 15 minutes. <laughs> well, I was going to save this when we got to the actual plot, but so all of this, her entire scene, like, wasn't scripted. It was all improv. And so they were like, yeah, just oh. lie on the bed and act like you're having a nightmare. Or that whole phone conversation with her mother not scripted Mm -hmm. she just made it up on the fly oh Oh, i love that that's interesting just trying to put the pieces of my life back together (laughs) and this is the only way i know how and i was like well what are you doing (laughs) (laughs) it would have been nice even if it could have been you know calendar appointment with therapist tomorrow or something like that right (laughs) yes (laughs) i mean she's got a really nice house though Oh, it's gorgeous. Yeah. Like, I don't know how you afford that on a camp counselor salary, but you do you, girl. It's huge, isn't it? And again, this feels like one of those few sequences in the whole Friday the 13th franchise that's like a kind of stalking slasher sequence in mm-hmm. just a house, right? Not in the yes. camp or whatever as well. Oh, and yeah. Joe and I are really big fans of establishing geography in a house. So even though we don't get a chase scene in this movie, I appreciate that we're just following her throughout this house. So we know the layout of this damn thing. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And we but get, a, we get a cat jump scare and everything. But yeah, sorry, we're getting ahead. No, <laughs> 
<laughs> okay, I'll, I'll go into it. So, okay, how this film came to be. Um, this film came out, like, just shy of a year after the first film. And following the success of that film, which in case y'all don't know, um, it grossed $40 million domestically on a $550,000 budget. Ooh, easy money. Despite being, like, critically, like, panned by pretty much every single critic out there. So it's like every horror film ever. <laughs> yes. <laughs> At least of this era, I feel yeah. like. Yeah. Paramount Pictures began plans to make a sequel, and of course, the issue here was that pretty much all of the cast and the main villain of the original film, save for Adrienne King's Alice, are dead. So, right. Phil Scuderi, uh, one of the three owners of Esquire Theatres, along with Steve Manazian and Bob Barsamian, wow, uh, <laughs> who produced the original film, insisted that the sequel have Jason Voorhees, uh, Pamela's son, even though his appearance in the original film was only meant to be a joke. Oh, before I get further, I should say most of this is coming from that Crystal Lake uh, Memories documentary. Of course. A classic. A classic, absolutely. Um, but of course, this makes no fucking sense, and Friday the 13th Part <laughs> 2 does absolutely nothing to make this plausible. They just... Oh Don't my even God. try. <laughs> the scene where we try to walk through how Jason could be an adult and he's like lived in the woods all this time, blah, blah, blah. You're just like, no, Incredible. stop it. Just stop. Incredible. <laughs> I have so many, I have so much to say about the timeline and the chronology of this series oh, as well. But anyway. Yes. <laughs> well, okay. But this is why though, whenever like I see horror fans get up in arms about like some continuity error or whatever in some newer horror film, I'm like, okay, but Let come on. You worship at the altar Friday the 13th and Halloween. Like, let's not fuck around here. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But yeah, so Victor Miller, uh, the writer of the original film, he says in an interview, like, no, like, Jason is 100% dead. And the makeup designer of that first film, Tom Savini, uh, says the same thing because they offered him the same gig for this film. And he was like, that makes no fucking sense. Jason's dead. I'm going to go to the burning instead. <laughs> Which, fantastic makeup. Yes. Yeah. Very fantastic. I, I think there's better kills in that movie than there are in this film. But uh, this yeah. film did get butchered by the MPAA. Oh, shocker. Shocker. <laughs> I feel like every time we talk about one of these fucking movies, it's just like, and you're not really seeing the way it was intended to because censored. Do y'all have the Screen Factory box set of these movies? Yes. Yes. Okay. So do y'all watch like the, uh, the slash scenes that show you the extra gore effects? A little bit. Yeah. 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 So for anyone who doesn't know, uh, yeah, these were pulled from a VHS tape from the the person who would wind up doing the makeup for this film, uh, Carl Fullerton. There's no sound. The quality is absolute shit. It's so dark. You can barely see half of them. Yes, yeah. but you do see the ice pit go through Alice's nose. Um, but she also does this really bad thing where she like sticks her tongue out and it ruins the scene. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, you do get a full body shot of Jeff and Sandra getting killed. Like there's more bleeding on Scott's death when he's hung on, uh, from the rope. Mm -hmm. oh, but honestly watching you're kind of like this was what they were up in arms about like yeah i don't really get it personally but i think it's just like it's just the times i guess yep yep it's the early 80s um but funnily enough though stan winston was supposed to replace tom savini but then he had a scheduling conflict which is when carl fullerton was brought in so we could have had a stan winston uh friday the 13th hmm interesting so Sean S. Cunningham, the director of the original film, wanted to move on to other things. Uh, in this case, 1982's Someone is Watching. So his protege, Steve Miner, who was an associate producer on the first film and would go on to direct films like Friday the 13th Part 3, House, Halloween H2O, and Lake Placid, mm -hmm. <laughs> he was brought on to direct in his place. A.K.A. Bangers, this guy. Oh, yeah. Ooh. Yeah, you, you said a trace. The direction in this film, I'm saying elevate, but not elevated. Yes. The direction in this film really takes the material to a new level. Well, so, Mike, I'm curious because I, I came into this kind of hard being like, this is the only one I find genuinely scary um, in, in the entire franchise. I'm curious your thoughts on that, like given Miner's direction, especially in that last act. Like, do you find this scary? Yeah, do you know what? I feel exactly the same as you. I think for a, for a franchise that is not particularly scary in a real mm -hmm. visceral way, this movie is the closest to that. And I think that is yeah. absolutely partly that's Steve Miner's direction. That moment when Ginny says someone is in the room with us, oh, that yeah. is a really chilling moment. I wish Friday yeah. the 13th had more moments like that, you know? It's really, really chilling. And, and I actually like the look of Jason in this movie as well. He's scarier looking oh, okay. than in any mm -hmm. of the other films, I think. I do too. For, for me, the big moment is when she finally makes it to jason's shack and like there's a shot where like there's the window on the left yeah. side 
side of the screen, and you can see Jason running through the window, but Ginny doesn't see him yet. Yeah. That's the scariest part of this whole franchise for me. <laughs> Ooh. Even the, the generic jump scares are really effective in this movie. Like, mm-hmm. I, you know at least two of them are coming, and then, as you said, Mike, I, I think I talked over you, there's a, a literal cat scare in this yes. movie. <laughs> yes, there is. I know. Yeah, there are some big jump scares in this, aren't there? Yeah. Mm-hmm. They're just surprisingly effective. Like, I'm not used to a Friday film actually getting me in that way. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's there's also that quite chilling moment, a similar kind of moment when uh, the the random cop that dies, right, when he pulls mm-hmm. over in the car and you get that shot of Jason just running into the woods across the yeah. road as well. It's those little yeah. fleeting blink and you miss the moments that are really good in this. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so I, there's, I don't think there's much fun casting news about this, except for Adrienne King, because there's a very well-known story about how she was pursued by an obsessed fan after the success of the original film. And so mm-hmm. there's two sides to this story here. One is that she wished her role to be as small as possible. However, in that Crystal Lake Memories documentary, she she doesn't really address that part of it, but she does, like... Someone comes in and basically says that her agent asked for too much money, and the studio said "fuck no" and basically wrote her out of the film. <laughs> oh, she's the original Nev Campbell. Wow. Yes. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I, 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 I'm sure she felt like shit too because it's like she shows up, no script, hey, improv all your scenes, and they shot it in like a day. Can you imagine? Jesus. Yeah, yeah, and I guess this is what sort of started this this trend that we got in a lot of 80s slashes particularly right of kind of killing off the final girl from the previous mm-hmm. installment in the in, like straight away in the next installment you know or just completely forgetting about her because we don't hear a thing about jenny after this yeah it's it's wild it's like do you not understand that people sure like jason you know we we like our killers we think they're interesting but also they're not really characters they're just mechanisms to up the body count and move the narrative along I think one of the issues that people who either cry misogyny or who just don't like that 80s wave of slashers, one of the things that they struggle with is just this disinterest from the creatives to actually invest in characters. So it's like, you give us a Ginny and then you don't think we want to see more of her? What the fuck are you thinking? Yeah. Yeah. But we're also churning these out. Like, Well, yeah. I mean, look, the screenplay for this movie is, I'll just say it, basic, but it's a lot (laughs) of what like the the production does to kind of make those things jump off the page when they weren't jumping off the page just in script form <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah and, and this is it and this is the this is the franchise that kind of really set in stone this kind of template right i mean like right. we we'd only had one halloween movie by this point we didn't have any nightmare on elm street movies and they were churning out these friday the 13th movies year mm-hmm. after year right and it, it's it's the franchise that created that template of we are just gonna swap in and out various different characters but yep. jason is the star right and this is where this kind of begins it feels like yeah yes absolutely it's that and it also feels like oh if we don't have another one of these films next year people are going to forget that we exist or we're leaving money on the table <laughs> well yeah. okay put a pin in that because i when i discuss the box office for this film i, I want to have that discussion as well okay yeah this is also i think the only time where jason was played by two actors if, mm-hmm. if i got that wrong I, I apologize i did try to research this and it's, i think i'm correct but um actor warrington gillette lost out on the role of paul so they offered him the role of jason which he accepted but unfortunately <laughs> gillette oh. couldn't do the stunts required of the part so okay there's a couple different stories here again uh, apparently he played jason <laughs> unmasked at the end of the film so he's yes. in the makeup mm. Where stuntman Steve Deskowish uh, apparently played the masked Jason throughout the rest of the film. However, this is weird because Laura Marie Taylor, who plays Vicky in that documentary, says that Gillette was her Jason. She doesn't oh. see the unmasked Jason in this film. Uh, unless unless when Jason's stalking her and kills her, like, they just didn't bother putting the mask on him in those POV shots. I don't mm, I don't know maybe. the answer to that. Yeah. Um, another fun fact, though, in the opening scene, Jason was played by a woman, the only woman to ever play Jason, uh, costume designer Ellen Letter, who also came up with his disguise, the potato sack. Oh, love that. Interesting. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, the feet as the itsy bitsy spider is going across. That's her. I don't think the hand that kills uh, Alice is her, but it's definitely mm-hmm. like the, that first shot of the feet. That's a woman. <laughs> so wild. Yeah. Uh, so by the end of September 1980, four months after the release of the original, they were already in production on the sequel. 
New to the team was 22-year-old Frank Mancuso Jr., who was just out of college and would become the driving force behind the franchise for many years to come. Now, mm-hmm. why is this 22-year-old twink uh, fresh out of college given such a, like, a prestigious <laughs> spot on this film? Do we know he's a twink? I, you know what? Um, there were some pictures, and um, <laughs> maybe he was a bit, he, he looked a bit more athletic than your standard twink. But, okay, um, okay. His father was the president of Paramount Pictures. <laughs> Nepo baby. <laughs> oh, Maybe not go. the original, but definitely one of them. <laughs> oh, definitely not the original. We had <laughs> Nepo babies in the 50s. But yeah, so like its predecessor, you know, this film had difficulty receiving an R rating. A total of 48 seconds had to be cut from the film in order to avoid the X. We've already gone through a bunch of them. I might go into more detail as we go through the plot. But um, the other salacious story with this, though, is that actress Marta Kober, who plays Sandra, was only 16 when they filmed Ooh. this. And I guess, you know, uh, by the time this comes out, we've already seen Totally Killer. And apparently in the 80s, they don't check anything and there's no privacy or anything. So... <laughs> There was a scene of her going full frontal. They they shot a 16-year-old girl in full frontal, and oh, um, this was in the VHS footage that Fullerton had that he gave to Scream Factory, you know, for the uh, extra kill scenes. But obviously, they cut that out because right. um, gross. Yeah, not appropriate. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Wow. So the film was released theatrically. Um, oh, yeah, they, they filmed this in a month. So like they filmed it basically for the whole month of October. It ends in early November. Released theatrically on May 1st, 1981, bringing in $6.4 million its opening weekend. And it goes on to gross just, quote unquote, $21.7 million against a budget of $1.25 million. And yeah. this is a little more than half the domestic gross of the first film. But it's mm-hmm. also like, what, a 21,000% yeah. increase over the budget? It's huge yeah. money compared to the budget, but when you look at what the original film did, it feels like, oh, this is half the gross. So, wow. yeah, yeah, in a way, I imagine they looked at it as a bit of a flop. But here's the funny thing, though. So part three grosses about $34 million the next year. And then there's a two-year gap between part three and the final chapter, and the final chapter grosses $32 million. So I just, I, huh. I don't know, like, what you're talking about, you know, where it's like, oh, we, we had to get these out one after the other because otherwise interest would wane. I think maybe the draw of three was the 3D aspect, yes. which is why it made more money. Absolutely. And then the final chapter is, you know, the final, <laughs> quote unquote, <Yeah>. chapter. <laughs> well, uh, well, basically, after part two, every movie has its, like, gimmick, doesn't it? Yes. Like, it's the it's the 3D one. It's the quote unquote final one. Then it's the quote unquote new beginning. Then it's the, mm-hmm. oh, no, Jason's back. Like, they had to find some way of kind of selling each and every installment after part two, didn't they? Right. <laughs> and, and that's, yeah. the, you know, again, like, like I said, I think this is a lot of more of the same. But I do think this is just a much better, more finessed version of that original film. Even, mm-hmm. the, well, I was going to say, even though we don't get mrs Voorhees, but we do get mrs Voorhees in this movie wow. yeah <laughs> yeah yeah I, I was wondering trace do you know if the sort of hologram mm-hmm. uh overlay of betsy palmer in the end of this film did they bring her back or did they just find a way to repurpose footage they did bring her back and it was okay. so funny because i had like it must be the mandela effect because i know that she's talked about the first film as being a piece of shit Mm-hmm. But they asked her back, and so I had it in my head that she told them no, and so they, yeah, they used repurposed footage. Um, no, they they brought her in, did some voiceover dialogue, and shot her, and that's her. Okay, wow, cool. But yeah, so this film was the 35th highest grossing film of 1981. I'm facing strong competition from other horror films like. Omen 3, um, sure. Uh, <laughs> the Evil Dead, The Howling, My Bloody Valentine, Happy Birthday to Me, Graduation Day, Halloween 2, and The Burning. And that's just like the heavy hitters. Like, like mm-hmm. this was a big slasher year. So there's probably a bunch of like shitty ones that had just disappeared into the ether that also came out that year. Oh, yeah. It's the ultimate slasher year, isn't it, really? 1981. It yeah. Yes. It's the year with the most number of slashers ever released. Yeah. Jesus Christ. Well, um, critics hated this. Uh, we've got a 28% <laughs> on Rotten Tomatoes with an average score of 4.4 out of 10, a 26 out of 100 on Metacritic, and Letterbox users have given it a generous 6 out of 10. Hmm. But those seem low. I'm not well, going to lie. I mean, we have to compare it to the others, but I, I think that's pretty good because I think you have people that are like, this is absolute horseshit. Like, this, this franchise sucks. And then, like, right. it's super fans who are giving it 4.5 out of 5. 
<laughs> yeah. Ah, yes, me, noted super fan of the Friday the 13th franchise. <laughs> uh, before I pass it over to you, Joe, I do want to say, so I am going to bring in Roger Ebert's review of this just because I think it's so fucking funny. So, oh, no. Here we go again. <laughs> he hated this movie. He gave it a half star. And he said, This film is a cross between the mad slasher and dead teenager genres. About two dozen movies a year feature a mad killer going berserk, and they're all about as bad as this one. Some have a little more plot. Some have a little less. It doesn't matter. And... So Ebert would never write another print review for any Friday the 13th film after that. Okay. Finishing his review of this film, saying, this review will suffice for the Friday the 13th film of your choice. <laughs> wow. Wow. Honestly, just such a broad generalization and so dickish. Like, guess what? We all have films that we don't always enjoy as film critics. Mm-hmm. And it's our responsibility to either give them a fair crack or not be inherently dismissive of the fact that they are connecting with a certain audience. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, uh, yeah, <laughs> I mean, Siskel is also the one who like spoiled the end of the first film in his review in an attempt to dissuade people from going to see it. Right. Jesus Christ. Yeah. <laughs> but um, but yeah, so that is Friday the 13th part two. Um, let's talk about this cold open. Okay. Yeah. So I'm curious when you two watch this movie, the opening sequence, to me, I immediately went to Halloween, even though we obviously were getting point of view shots in the first Friday the 13th. But to me, this feels so much like, hey, everybody's seen Halloween, right? Well, that's kind of what the first one is, too. <laughs> oh, for yeah. Sure. Yeah. But no, I completely agree. This opening scene makes it feel more like your Halloween type slasher, doesn't it? For sure. And again, I like mm-hmm. the kind of creepy shots of the kids singing the nursery rhyme. Like, I don't know. It feels like it's going for a more classic, I don't yeah. know, almost gothic y horror or something in this opening sequence. Yeah. But it's also a different setting than what we're used to for this franchise because we're not in the woods, we're not in a mm-hmm. cabin. We're in what I presume to be a suburbia. Yeah. 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 Yeah, I mean, I I like the fact, too, that we open with a kid. I think that's part of the other reason I think of Halloween is because in that cold open to John Carpenter's film, we're following kids as they're trick-or-treating, right? And it seems like, oh, is that kind of what we're doing here? The answer is no. We're literally temporarily following a child, and then we just veer directly into uh, Alice's apartment. But it's it's still interesting it, it almost has a little georgie from it vibe i think mm-hmm. like i think yeah. it starts with the kids singing itsy bitsy spider as well in the rain oh. like that so yeah that's the weird little connection there but yeah I, I like it i think it's quite a nice way to sort of start this movie off mm-hmm. but okay can we talk about whatever the fuck alice is wearing in this scene <laughs> green plaid overalls over i think a green shirt <laughs> incredible <laughs> oh boy i just like just wear this casually around your house i guess or when you're sleeping in the middle of the bed like not even like on a pillow <laughs> you know what trace yeah. this is what trauma looks like it forces you into <laughs> one single color block in terms of your outfits and yeah you don't know how to use a pillow anymore <laughs> <laughs> yeah so we get this extended recap of number one as we mentioned via nightmare she's tossing and turning and then uh you know like any good horror movie when she fends off a phone call from her mom who you know wants her to come home and she's like now i gotta do my own thing after that, she takes a shower because, of course, she does. Okay, but I actually thought this was really clever. This almost felt metatextual to me. Like, I mean, mm-hmm. <sighs> look, anytime we see a shower in a horror film, I feel like we're it's referencing psycho. psycho. But specifically with this, because we get that POV of the camera approaching the shower. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And it's not a jump scare, but the way she opens it and just looks directly at the camera, i.e. the audience. I thought it's this startling. was a, Yeah, I thought it was a really fun little nod to what I'm assuming was an intentional homage to, to Psycho. Yeah, so. yeah. And also there's that slight metatextual element to the fact that we're killing off our final girl in yeah. the opening um, scene. You know, there's a there's a Janet Lee vibe to that too, that kind of misdirection absolutely. maybe, I suppose. Yeah. Well, because I think it's because hey, the trailer for this film just repeats what we do in the first film, where we basically show the lead up to every single fucking death and then just mm-hmm. count from, you know, 14 to 26. And I always forget, you know, oh yeah, people back here didn't just have access to trailers. Like they had to see them in a theater theater. so like spoilers i guess didn't really matter that much but i I, I do wonder who was walking into this and started watching this movie being like oh yay like our girl's back and like we're fine 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that, it's true. I forgot about those trailers. Like again, the it's the the way in which these movies literally sell themselves on the body count, basically, yes. right? I mean, that is literally what these films are. They're just body count movies. I mean, the tagline yeah. for this is "The body count continues." Dot dot yeah. dot. Yeah. <laughs> Amazing. We're not going to talk to you about the plot. We're not going to try to sell you on some fantastic new adventure. It's really just like, come to watch teenagers get killed. Yeah. But remember, that's how it happened in the first one, because Cunningham took out an ad in Variety or something that just right. said Friday the 13th coming soon. And he had no fucking script ready. This was just a, hey, are people interested in this? And lo mm-hmm. and behold, you do like a gimmick, like just the name Friday the 13th. And yes, sure. people are interested. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. And I'm going to correct myself before anybody sends an angry tweet or email. I said that they are like high school students or like young adults. And obviously, these are all at least college age into their early 20s. Well, except for Sandra. Well, (laughs) it's notwithstanding. (laughs) Oh, God. Um, Yeah, the other thing that I really notice about this opening sequence is how closely Minor is shooting this. Like, Mm -hmm. Tracy mentioned, you know, the shower curtain opens and we see Alice. We are in her fucking face. Like, it is so close to the action. It feels both intimate, but also intrusive. It's claustrophobic in a way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I just liked it because it feels different from a conventional POV shot that we sometimes get in these films where it feels like the camera is about 10 feet away from all the actors. It's yeah. voyeuristic in a way, yeah. Yeah, it's true. And actually, there is a lot of... The Friday the 13th movies in general have this thing, and this movie has it too, where you know, you've got like a chase scene in the woods and it's basically just a big, slightly boring wide shot of just one person <laughs> running from left to right in the frame yeah. right and uh these movies can't really get away from that a lot of the time but yeah it's nice to see something looking a little bit different in this opening mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. so uh we find the decapitated head of mrs Voorhees in the fridge which suggests to us that jason just carries his mom's head around with i him? mean look i need to i don't need to know but i want to know where is alice's house in relation to camp crystal lake right mm-hmm. right exactly <laughs> like did he get a load of public transport to get yeah. here how did Hitch he tra- ride i can't imagine him like doing his research into finding her home address and all of that stuff as well like I, yeah how did this happen mm-hmm and also, <laughs> I don't know if this is what it is, but it almost looks like a, like a coastal town. Um, and hmm. I don't know why I'm thinking that. I, just, I feel like they may be in the rain. I'm like, oh, there's water nearby. <laughs> oh but I'm just like, now you gotta walk your ass all the way back to fucking Camp Crystal Lake with your shack and your shitty toilet? Okay. Yeah. And is he presumably wearing that sack over his head the whole time? <laughs> <laughs> I guess we should point out, too, like, I mean, I don't know if this was... Because they reference the town that treaded sundown in that documentary, but I don't know mm-hmm. if that was a thing where, like, again, this costume designer was like, oh, that was a popular thing back in the time. Because her sure. reasoning for giving Jason the potato sack was, this is something that someone living in a shack in the woods would probably have easy access to, like this type of material. As opposed to a hockey mask. Well, I mean, yeah. you know, we got to get Shelly out there in that third one. Oh, God, don't ever talk to me about Shelly. <laughs> Everyone hates Shelly. I, la- I feel Shelley. so bad for Shelly. <laughs> I mean, who's worse, Ted or Shelly? No, you know what, though? I feel like people really rag on the... Uh, is it Chris? Is that her name in that movie, The Final Girl? Um, I actually really like that because that bitch just goes insane at the end of the movie. Like, oh, she's great. Yeah. She's hauled off in a cop car. Oh, oh, oh okay. Not to go divert too far away, but <laughs> there was a really scary shot in that movie at the very end where she's in the boat mm-hmm. in the pond and she looks up into the barn and sees the unmasked Jason see her through the window. Yeah. And he gives this like really like, creepy delighted like laugh that you can't hear you just see him clearly laughing as he then starts to run towards her Ooh. it's scary as fuck <laughs> yeah so you yeah. admit there's another friday phone that's scary that part is scary i actually i feel i feel like people don't rank three very high in their rankings i yeah. like three a lot yeah i think parts one two and three are the only three that feel like i like the early years of friday the 13th movies like i like mm-hmm. these the first four when they had this kind of slightly grainier grittier early 80s vibe and and mm-hmm. jason wasn't this huge kane hodder like presence right in these mm-hmm. early movies uh yeah. but uh, but also those first three movies particularly do have final girls right as well like they do have characters that you want to support and root for in right. like chris and Ginny and alice and i, I feel like beyond the first three that kind of disappears a little bit doesn't it i think well i think because in final chapter they're like we have whoever cory feldman's sister is but we're, we're splitting time in that movie between mm-hmm. like the two sides like the kids at the camp and then the family so it, it loses that aspect i think a bit 
Yeah. Yeah. Which is wild, too, because these films are never hurting for characters. There's often no. too many of them, and we don't get to know them well enough. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay, so Alice bites it pretty early. She gets, as we've said, an ice pick through the temple. And this is an interesting weapon choice for Jason. A little bit dainty, not gonna right? lie. Well, yeah. it's a woman's weapon. <laughs> <laughs> as Sharon Stone would tell us, yes. Oh, but as we already said, this Jason was played by a woman. Maybe mm-hmm. not his hands, but those feet. <laughs> Jason's just experimenting with their gender identity in these early moments of the film. So you know what? An ice pick, too light. I think I'm going to go with more machete spear action later. Well, I was going to say, Mike, so like, because I feel like whenever people say, oh, like, what's Jason's weapon? I mean, fuck, in Scream 4, that question is asked. And it's a machete. And I was like, like, what? Because I feel like mm-hmm. he uses a wide variety of weapons. Like, he doesn't just use a machete, but is yeah. it because he uses that one the most often? I think it's, I think again, so. it's this weird thing where I think when people think of Friday the 13th, they're actually picturing part six onwards, right? They're thinking um, that big, hulking, zombie-like Jason with the hockey mask carrying a machete. And we don't really get that until much later on in the series it feels like right and i really like mm-hmm. this kind of scrawnier scrappier <laughs> jason that we get in this movie you know yeah yeah he somehow makes more sense in this form like i've seen a lot of speculation online that it's when he gets reanimated and he basically becomes a godlike figure yes that's when he can become hulking and unkillable and as a result it makes sense to hire someone who looks like a wrestler to play him but yeah i mean this is a guy who's purportedly lived in the woods for a number of years <laughs> feasting on what berries and potatoes from this sack so <laughs> yeah. i would expect him to be a little scrawny well also arguably a dog but we see a dog well, corpse in this movie that looks just like muffin but then muffin comes in later so i guess they the were just two fake out what the fuck <laughs> oh, that's brilliant that little muffin moment at the end there muffin. as well amazing <laughs> oh i mean okay also i think that replicates that canoe scare in that first movie very 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 well mm-hmm yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah yeah okay so alice is dead uh this is around the 12 minute mark of the <laughs> film so uh we're basically around one hour to go <laughs> um and two minutes of opening credits <laughs> Correct. <laughs> Amazing. Yes. And can I just say, I love the score for these movies, oh, right? It's so intense. It goes hard. Mm-hmm. It goes mm-hmm. so hard. <laughs> it's just like, this score feels like it's for, forgive me, a better film. <laughs> no, I, yes. I, I don't even disagree with you. And so I actually have this score on vinyl. And one of my friends came over and he was like, oh, I don't really like, I, I, he's like, I'll listen to like movie scores, but I don't want to listen to Friday the 13th Part 2. It's a little too like intense for if yeah. he was working from home. And I was like, I know, but like it... It's so good. <laughs> when I listen to a score, I actually do visualize the scene that it plays over, like as mm. I'm listening to it. Mm. And so it's like a way to watch the movie without watching the movie. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> actually, you guys mentioned earlier the uh, Crystal Lake memories. I think I've come to sort of enjoy watching that more than watching mm. through the whole films, you know, yeah. like <laughs> just like give me the highlights with the interviews, you know, and sometimes I right. find that a little bit more entertaining than rewatching these films multiple times. <laughs> well, I also, I mean, for me personally, I like watching watching people involved in the films talk about the legacy, the release, the reception, mm-hmm. and, be- and yeah. being frank about, yeah, this is like a piece of shit movie, but like, look what happened to it. Like, I just, yeah. I find those conversations very interesting. And so, yeah, I, I get where you're-, where you're coming from. Yeah, I think that's the thing with Friday the 13th. Like, I covered them extensively when I did a slasher season mm-hmm. of, of my mm-hmm. podcast because, and they're, they're so interesting. They're so interesting for so many reasons to talk about and lots of the stuff we've already said, really, and the, the way in which, even though Halloween did kind of design the template, it was really Friday the 13th that kind of made it a template right and there's all these kind of interesting things to talk about around these movies and again i do love and i'm not i'm not i don't mean to be mean about these films because i do enjoy them but i think sometimes Mm -hmm. they're more interesting to talk about than they are to watch yeah 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 Yeah. i mean particularly as you said this franchise because it got into so many troubles i'm always most fascinated by the mpa because i think it's almost it's like a trapped in amber glimpse into the past where you can really see what we're refocusing on. And yeah. I think it future forecasts a lot of the issues that other horror films will butt up against as they come into wide release. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay, so we got credits. And when we come back, we are reintroduced to Crazy Ralph, who is played by Walt Gorney, once again, the other actor that reprises their role in this film. <laughs> uh, basically, this is the harbinger. If you can watch these scenes with him without thinking of Cabin in the Woods, you're a better movie watcher than me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. 
<laughs> so uh, Crazy Ralph is watching Sandra, who, as you mentioned, Trace is played by Marta Kober, as well as Jeff, who is played by Bill Randolph. They are calling someone that we have not met yet named Ted on the payphone. And it's your favorite gag, Trace. Something is happening in the back. Their truck is being towed. I yeah I must say so Mike I love it when like something like chaotic is happening in the background but the characters we're focusing on like have no I, like they don't even notice it um <laughs> such a good gag for me yeah but also I feel like I always forget this happens in this scene mm-hmm. and then that it's actually Ted who was in cahoots with the tow truck guy <laughs> yeah 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 I'd kind of completely forgotten about this moment as well yeah I think part of the reason is that it ultimately doesn't really come to anything. It introduces Ted as a bit of a prankster. We'll see this again when he jumps out at the end of Paul's story by the campfire. Mm-hmm. You know, it gives us a bit of idea of who he is. Not much about Sandra and Jeff. I would argue that they are probably the weakest characters in this movie because all we know is that they want to fuck. Okay, I find this very interesting because I, I was surprised to hear you like single out Terry and Scott earlier, which... Mm-hmm. But it is interesting because I feel like they have the least screen time out of all these characters. I think they make a bigger impression. Yes, absolutely. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. So we haven't said Ted is played by Stuart Tarno. Um, Yeah, he was in cahoots with Max, the tow truck driver. But he ends up getting a ride with them because we are en route to counselor training. But we end up getting blocked by a large tree that has fallen across the road. And as the boys clear it away, that's when we see the sign for Camp Crystal Lake aka camp blood camp blood and sandra will not let this shit go she wants to go there god damn it <laughs> yeah like this this is her defining character trait sandra do you just want to go to pound town at camp blood is that what's turning you on <laughs> that's i mean honestly the fact that we don't get a sex scene between them in one of these cabins mm-hmm. uh, is robbery well i mean they're getting cock blocked by the cop Sure. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we make it to camp, and we've got a bevy of hot counselors, including our disabled character, Mark, who is played by queer actor Tom McBride. Okay, I'm going to I'm gonna gonna step in here. Yeah, I want to do it now. So I don't remember when I learned that he was gay. And of course, if you don't know, um, he did die from AIDS-related complications in 1995. Um, he actually through HIV AIDS, got a disease called PML, which is progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy. Ooh, you practiced that since the last time we talked. <laughs> I did. Um, now this is a disease of uh, the white matter of the brain caused by a viral infection um, uh, that targets cells that make the myelin, um, the material that insulates nerve cells uh, and neurons. And so he has had a lot of seizures in the weeks leading up to his death. Mm-hmm. So I went to his Wikipedia, and there is a, it was a documentary made in 1996. It's a 45 minute long documentary. Um, you can find this on YouTube, and we will link to it in the show notes. Mm-hmm. It's basically like a it's shot on video um, by one of his friends, and it's interviews with him. And the I'm not quite sure of the timeline. I think it's the months leading up to his death. Months. Okay, so did you watch this, Joe? I did. Yeah, it's about 45 minutes. If you want to see him naked, you can see full yep. dong. It is upsetting i will confess like it starts off and he's very proud and boastful about his status as an a-list gay because he's very hot and he's kind of made it as a model and an actor and by the end of the film he's almost non-verbal because he's so ill so he's paralyzed yeah it's it's pretty upsetting it's i think it's a good document i mean it's there's not really like a through line here we're just kind of like it's like slices of life almost as we check mm-hmm. in and he'll he'll talk about random topics i will say it's a very interesting time capsule into this particular lifestyle at this particular time yeah there is some bottom shaming on his part where like he, someone asks him like oh if you were getting fucked a lot would you feel more like a woman and he says absolutely because mm-hmm. he is apparently a power top but i also kind of respect his candor which i guess he's in his mind he's thinking like i'm going to die soon so i can say whatever the fuck i want also the internet doesn't (laughs) very frank and so i I think some of it makes him come across like a bit of a jerk sometimes but again Mm -hmm. when you put it in the context of again this time period what he's going through it it does make sense but i just want to kind of warn people who have maybe been thirsting after this man since Mm -hmm. they've seen this film well, you he's might a human being. With... I mean, yes. he's he's got some flaws. There's a couple of things where you just think, oh, well, this doesn't age very well. But as you said, this is probably a relatively common or maybe a little bit more common than we might have expected mindset for, yeah, mid-90s, somebody who has survived the AIDS epidemic, quote unquote, but not really. And to be clear, um, bottom shaming exists today still. So oh, it's not 100%. like it's not like it's new. <laughs> 
Yeah. I mean, I'm curious, Mike, did you know that this actor was queer? I did, but only through... Because you had done your own research? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Like the, when I covered it on my own podcast, it was only then that I found out really looking into the film. And and then also, you know, everyone's really sweet about him on the Crystal Lake Memories documentary, aren't they? I think yeah. like they tell stories about how all of the all of the women had the hots for him. And, you know, right. he had to kind of you know, be like, ah, no, you know, not my type, obviously. And like, yeah, but um, it sounded like everyone absolutely loved him on set. Right. But by all accounts, he was the one. I mean, even like the, the friends that are with him in this documentary, like, it, honestly, the, the hardest part for me is there's a part of the documentary where he basically decides to leave New York. He's going to go back to Florida and basically live out the remainder of his days uh, with his mom in Florida. Mm -hmm. And you watch all of his friends say goodbye to him as he gets in the car and like one of them just starts crying. And I was like, oh, yeah, like Oof. it's interesting seeing this subject who's like, I know I'm going to die in a very short amount of time. Mm hmm. Yeah, I guess the other thing that we haven't acknowledged is that he is not disabled in real life. He was right. able-bodied. So I guess another instance of things that we probably wouldn't do that way had this film been made now. I will say, though, um, watching Vicky try to roll him down this hill, um, this camp is not... No. Uh, they have a lot of accessibility options. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god, yeah. Yeah. I mean, there is a ramp to get into the cottage, but then, yeah, like, when you see him die, and it just feels like insult to injury when you see the wheelchair go down this giant fucking flight of stairs. Oh. It's like, wow, okay, movie. <laughs> I think he gets the penis death in this movie and I but I like it like it's it's so ridiculous that I kind of can't help but laugh because he goes down like a first small set of stairs mm -hmm. and then we cut and all of a sudden it's like the fucking exorcist stairs. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it is it's like that scene is 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 often like cited as one of the fans like favorite kills in the franchise, isn't it? And and it so is like weird. it is it is kind of weird and I wonder if it is because it is just a particularly nasty one, isn't it? Again, mm -hmm, yeah. it's it's not just like blinking you miss it. It's there's something kind of extra prolonged and mean-spirited about it which is you know which is often what you want in a slasher film too you know? i think it's also because it's so memorable right like right. often the kills that we like the most are the ones that we remember the most and this <laughs> does have that unique quality also because we do get the shot of the machete in his face right yes, we do okay yeah and it's just like i mean you just don't really see that a lot <laughs> well and particularly in this movie where there's only a couple of deaths we actually see on screen you mm -hmm. know there's a couple that are off screen or there's some where we start to see it and then we cut midway through so this yeah. one is very much like you get to see this character die yeah and there's like the thunder and lightning and everything mm -hmm. as well and oh, it's just yeah. it's just quite a cool looking kind of set piece isn't it well, i think yeah and a freeze frame to white out to transition to the next scene yeah, yeah. which always weirds me out i'm like wait a white out okay. yeah <laughs> what an interesting transition choice <laughs> yeah so also at this camp we have pervy dark-haired scott who is played by russell todd i will confess between these two men hunka hunka this movie yeah, very much so. <laughs> Every, yeah, almost everyone in this film is is really hot They're in one gorgeous. way or another, right? They're yeah. gorgeous, yeah. Because yeah. <laughs> Terry is up next, and I'm not going to lie, this is interesting. You know, Terry is a very confident woman. She's obviously incredibly fit. Mm. Kristen Baker is in fantastic fucking shape but i love that she basically does not own a shirt that covers her midriff and she does not own shorts that cover the bottom part of her butt cheeks <laughs> as as we see in quite prolonged close-ups for quite a lot of this mm -hmm. film as oh well. <laughs> i mean look the mpa had issues with the gore in this movie they had no issue with full bush clearly <laughs> but also i mean if you've got a body like this fucking show it off she is amazingly gorgeous yeah yeah, so we're having this meeting. It is being led by Paul, who is played by John Fury. And midway through the meeting, Ginny, a.k.a. Amy Steele, final girl extraordinaire, shows up in her backfiring VW bug. And of course, this pisses him off. Question for you two. What does the line, this place is starting to look like a Burger King, mean? <laughs> it's a very good question. I have absolutely <laughs> like, no idea. Why, Paul, when you look at a bunch of cars in a parking lot, do you think of a Burger King? Like a drive through or something? I don't know. Maybe. W was it a hangout spot in 1981? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> um, I will say, so question for y'all. Do you think that this... Because I feel like immediately, Ginny is kind of 
the bad girl she's, like bad she's girl. breaking the rules yeah. and so i feel like watching this and maybe because it's 81 we don't have these quote-unquote rules yet mm -hmm. but i feel like you're kind of meant to think that she's not going to be long for this world based on how she's a rule breaker yeah i was watching it today and my wife was sitting next to me she'd never seen it before and Ooh. at this moment when Ginny appeared she was like oh so let me guess she's probably gonna die first right and that was oh. literally what she said because yeah i think you're absolutely right trace like she's introduced as the as the bad girl that would probably in certain other slasher movies get punished for being the bad girl right mm -hmm. right yeah. and, and we don't see her fuck paul but she's no. definitely fucking paul definitely. yeah because they have a kissy makeout session a little bit later which i'll confess i find deeply disappointing because paul sucks <laughs> he does. Just like, he really Jamie, does. You're clearly introduced as a much more interesting, well-rounded character. <laughs> no, no real shade on Paul. I mean, the character doesn't get much to do. He's the person in charge of the camp, so obviously he's going to be a bit more straight laced. But the minute that we saw them making out, I just thought, mm, girl, no, you can do better. Well the movie also doesn't give a shit about him because he no. just leaves the movie and we have no idea what happened to him. Mm -mm. Where is Paul? We don't know. We don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Same with Ted. Oh, T Ted gets off scot-free, man. Uh, he's going to come back to this. Uh, you know what? I'm a firm believer that he's probably the one that found everything right. <laughs> and called the cops. Oh, yeah. This movie basically says if you're going to be a camp counselor, your best bet to avoid getting murdered is to get absolutely plastered in town. Basically. <laughs> So that night at the campfire, Paul repeats the five-year-old urban legend about Crystal Lake and the murders and how the girl who survived disappeared. And then this is when Ted leaps out and scares everyone. Ooh. It's good. It's a good scene, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> it's interesting, though. Okay, so I think, Mike, you said you wanted to gently try to figure out some of the timeline. Do you think five years is enough time to have passed? It's incredible. I, I mean, I don't know. I guess so. I guess maybe it's it's enough time that it's still recent enough that people kind of know about this thing, but, mm -hmm. but far enough away that I guess, you know, stuff can happen around this lake again and not right. be too big a deal. Uh, but I, I just love this idea that I think part one, even though it came out in 1980, was set in 1979, technically. Because yeah. mm -hmm. they filmed it then. Which means this is set in the future, right? This is set in 1984 yes. at the time this movie came out. And then I think parts three and four all take place across the, the same, same night, weekends, the same night. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, oh, th that's what I miss, Joe. We have also covered Jason Goes to Hell. So I don't know if y'all were yelling at me. Right. I remember that. But yeah. like, th so basically, given the timeline for all these films, I want to say Jason Goes to Hell is supposed to take place in 2008. Yes, yeah, I think it does. I think we we I laid out like the whole timeline at one point, and um, <laughs> and and so I think you know in the and, and I can't remember exactly, but I think at this point in time, i.e., twenty twenty three, Jason should be frozen, right? He's right. in stasis yes. right now, yeah. and um, so you can't make any other movies that are set in this particular at this particular time in the in the chronology of Friday the Thirteenth. <laughs> it explains why we haven't gotten any new ones. It has nothing to do with legalities. It's exactly. just that Jason's still on ice. I'm sorry, or you can do that and just not explain it. <laughs> well, <Wow. Yeah. laughs> <laughs> Okay, so, yes, we've had the scare out. We basically introduced everybody, however tangentially. And then we move into the, let's give each of these characters a little bit more shading. So we see Scott dancing with Muffin the dog in an effort to woo Terry. We've got Ginny winning a game of chess against a very perplexed looking Paul. Like, how did I get beaten by this girl? <laughs> You know what, though? It's better than the Monopoly scene in that first movie, which I think goes on for 100 hours. <laughs> oh, my God. Yeah, this is it. That's that's the main thing I remember about the first Friday the 13th. Right? This is oh Monopoly. Look, I, I, I am on record. The first film ranks in the bottom half of the franchise for me. I love the Mrs. Voorhees stuff, but I think it's sure. so fucking boring. <sighs> yeah. I mean, yes, you're probably right. And I think the thing is, is that for me, there's not a huge amount of difference in any of them. And again, that sounds like I'm mm. being mean on the whole franchise, but there are there are parts of all of them that I love, but there are chunks of all of them. Again, it's the Monopoly chunk in every film that I <laughs> I, 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 glaze, I glaze over. <laughs> Wait, I'm sorry. Also, I, f I feel compelled to mention this. There is a black counselor in that campfire scene, and we mm -hmm. never see this person again. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, because this movie is wild. White as a mayonnaise jar. <laughs> well, there's a part later. Oh, it's it's whenever Mark and Vicky are trying to hook up, and he's like, "Oh, well, Tim's in my cabin," and I was like, "Who's Who? Tim?" <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, they were actually like. There's a bunch more. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's just we don't bother to get to know any of them because it's like, no, they're not going to get killed by Jason, so you yeah. don't need to know them. I guess it's like, <laughs> did everyone else just go to the bar or somewhere else that night? I think so. Yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, so we're really just following the people who stayed behind and then Ginny and Paul who come back from the bar. Right. Well, Paul basically murders uh, Sandra and Jeff secondhand because they would have gone to that bar. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yes. <laughs> and he's got to live with that for the rest of his life if he's not already if dead. He's, if yes. he's already dead. <laughs> who knows? <laughs> uh, uh, speaking of death, we've got Crazy Ralph's death here. He dies by garrot outside of the cottage. Mm-hmm. Love a good garrot. Yeah, it's, again, a very interesting choice for Jason. Not sure what this is made of. Like, is there a piano lurking somewhere around Crystal Lake? I was thinking it was barbed wire. (laughs) It could be that. Yes, I assumed it was barbed wire as well, yeah. But again, there's something (laughs) kind of creepy looking about that moment. I don't know. It's like, I like like the kills in this. I I like that they're not all just a big machete to the face and that's it, you know? Oh, yeah, for sure. Yeah. So the next morning, the group sets out on a team-building forest hike. This is when Muffin meets Jason and we think, oh, okay, well, that dog is surely dead. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) We also have uh, Ginny briefly using Chekhov's chainsaw. Yes! Okay, so I literally, in my notes, I put, how does this chainsaw not come back later? It does. And it does. (laughs) Ever so briefly. I forgot. (laughs) (laughs) And this is also where Sandra really starts to lean on Jeff that she wants to go to Camp Blood. So they do go and we discover what we believe at the time to be Muffin's mutilated corpse. But uh, it will not be. I think it even has the pink bow. (laughs) It's just, how do you kill the only dog we've seen on screen thus far and then later on walk it back? And never introduce another dog. (laughs) Doesn't this also feel like a Halloween homage, though? Because Michael does kill a dog in that movie and eat it. Mm. Apps. I I am sure that that was supposed to be Muffin, and then they realized right. they needed a moment of calm to set us up for the big jump scare, uh, and so yeah. therefore let's just have a little fake out with Muffin being still alive, right? Like I feel yeah. like that was the only reason. And we've got to get into post production. This movie comes out in like a day. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> we don't have time to fix that shit. Yeah, we need something sweet and wholesome to have some sweet, wholesome music so that we can then scare the shit out of you all with uh, Jason Absolutely. bursting through the window. Yeah, uh, yes. But I mean, honestly, if we if we have to walk back Muffin's desk so that we can get that jump scare, worth it. Worth it. Absolutely. <laughs> and the dog doesn't die. There we go. Well, well dog a dog does dies, die, but not, not the dog. dog. <laughs> <laughs> R.I.P. Whatever dog that was. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, there's a fan video waiting in the wings to be made where it's just like some poor girl around this lake is like, Bitsy? Yes. Bitsy? <laughs> if, if, this was, if this was the Saw franchise, there'd be another whole movie set in the right. same chronology as this that would show you a different perspective and other people dying. Like, what really <laughs> happened to Paul and Ted and, and this dog? Right. You know? <laughs> I feel Woodwatch. like, oh God, I'm sure people are yelling at us, but I feel like maybe it said somewhere that in the script Paul died or mm. there was uh, there was something filmed that showed mm. him in the ambulance too. But again, this may be the Mandela effect where I'm just imagining yeah. this. <laughs> <laughs> I cannot recall, but yeah. Uh, okay, so Jeff and Sandra are discovered by the cop who is played by Jack Marks and he brings them back to Paul and Paul doesn't really care about punishing them so he says okay well you two can't do anything and the cop is very disappointed but it doesn't matter because he's about to die in the woods when he stumbles into the cabin and he is murdered with the sharp end of a hammer so the uh the 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 slash scenes um you definitely get a longer shot of the hammer hitting his skull and a Mm -hmm. big splatter of blood flying out of it which i appreciate yeah but also this asshole like hey this is a one lane street and he just blocks traffic to go chase jason into the woods <laughs> yes he thinks so that there's true. a murder on the loose <laughs> I, but, but, but what you said earlier mike though you, like, you get the glimpse this is the first glimpse of the potato sack and it's such mm-hmm. a quick shot that it, it actually is kind of scary <laughs> yeah it is yeah. there's something creepy about it isn't there i really like that little glimpse yeah yeah it's surprising i mean it shouldn't be surprising but it is how often the films just rely on a point of view to convey Mm -hmm. some kind of sense of menace whereas something fleeting like this is actually i would argue more impactful yeah and i guess this is sort of when the the, this franchise stops being a whodunit thing right too i mean obviously like the first movie technically is a whodunit a really bad one yeah because it's like well nobody (laughs) saw mrs Voorhees until until the last act but (laughs) um but uh this movie i don't think it's playing on any kind of mystery is it like it's fairly obvious that this is jason from the start yeah yeah Yeah. we're name dropping him too often for it to be someone else 
and, and also he's carrying his dead mother's head around and putting them in fridges and things. So oh, it would be a bit weird if it yeah. wasn't him. Yeah. Honestly, though, for five years, it's in pretty good condition. Mm-hmm. Right. The yeah. fact that she's got any skin left. What's going on there? <laughs> I will say, though, it's really fun. So, like, watching these early films, because in the Friday the 13th video game, which is kind of still going on, but not really, mm-hmm. um, the, the, the maps are the different maps from, like, one, two, three, and 4. Um, mm-hmm. It was really fun watching some of these scenes at, the, at, the, uh, at this camp to be like, oh, my God, I, I ran up there and hid in that cabin so many times. But also... Every map has this shack in it because oh, okay. the whole thing is like there's a part of the game where if you're a female player in the game, you can go in and grab Jason's sweater and then you have to go to Jason, but then you have to press a certain button right before he's about to hit you and then you can hypnotize him for like five seconds. And if <laughs> Tommy Jarvis is also in the game, then he can kill Jason. It's the hardest fucking thing to do. <laughs> oh, my God. Mm, sounds wow. like very convoluted and also exciting. It's very exciting. Uh, the, the, honestly, we just kind of did a private game and just did it ourselves because t- trying to do this like in real time, like with another player, it's impossible. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, fun. Okay, so Ginny, Paul, and Ted head into town with the other counselors who don't have names and we will never meet. <laughs> and they're basically going for beer time. Everybody else decides to stay back more or less so that they can fuck. Kind of. Yes. So that's definitely Sandra and Jeff's intention, but Vicky is also doing her best to butter up Mark. And then we have (laughs) Terry taking her extreme crop top to go skinny dipping. Okay, Terry's like, I'm going to go for a walk. And I was like, bitch, it is nighttime outside. What the fuck are you going to do? And then yeah, she wants to go skinny dipping in this disgusting ass lake in the middle of the night. Like, (laughs) she had it coming. (laughs) Trace loves God. nature, so I okay. I I hate feeling the mud of a lake water like on my oh. feet. Like I, I I'm wearing pool shoes. I am with you a hundred percent, Trace. That would put me off immediately. I would need some sort of footwear on for that. Yeah, you for sure. Divas. Just get in the water. Oh my god. Well look what happens when you get in the water. Nothing. She goes for a swim, Scott steals her clothes, and it's only because they run into a fucking trap that anything bad happens. Basically. Um I I, I like the little like the, the kind of foreplay we're getting between Terry and Scott here. Mm-hmm. And I like that she also threatens to just leave him there and calls him a pervert because there's yeah. nothing I love more than the word pervert <laughs> no, <laughs> and he is a pervert just... he does deserve to hang there for a bit i mean his character is introduced hitting her in the butt with a slingshot oh yeah as we get the <laughs> yes. fast and the furious like but like a low level butt shot of her yes <laughs> fully zooming up her ass what is this a michael bay movie what do y'all call perverts <laughs> yeah. in the uk sex pests right Sex. I mean, we 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 like pervert too, but yes, sex pest. Mm-hmm. Sex pest is a good is 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 definitely a good one. Yeah. See, it just sounds so much better with your accent, Mike. When we say it, it's like sex pest. <laughs> I mean, honestly, when I say pervert, like, what which Schwarzenegger is? Is it Kindergarten Cop, where he's like, I'm not the pervert. <laughs> mm-hmm. I do believe you're right. Yep. <laughs> Uh, so needless to say scott gets hung upside down and this feels a little texas chainsaw massacre to me but mm-hmm. um he he gets machete throat slit and and his his extended death it's just like, like a, a, honestly a, like a 10 second shot of blood just pouring out of his neck wound okay yeah. i was gonna say this feels a bit underwhelming yeah yeah, basically in the original cut, it would have held longer and we would have seen a lot more blood. A, a, a quick spray, but mostly it just like runs down his head. Right. Okay. Mm. Uh, Terry comes back after trying to find some help and she is killed off screen, presumably, because she screams. And then we use that to transition into a mix with the band's audio at the bar that Ginny and Paul and Ted are at. That actually makes me excuse the fact that this is an off screen kill. It's a good transition. Yeah, I also just like, I mean, like, again, her, like, again, it's the thing, the same with Alice at the shower at the beginning of the movie, where she's staring directly at Jason slash us, the audience, and there's something, there is something mm-hmm. scary about seeing her just scream, like, her blood-curdling scream right at you. At us, yeah. Yeah, and I like that trope of, like, then we immediately smash cut to, like, something loud happening yeah. elsewhere, mm-hmm. right? It's uh, it's used a lot in uh, my favorite slasher, Black Christmas, that is, like, used over and yes. over again in Black Christmas, isn't it? Yeah, it's mm-hmm. great. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so this is the scene where I think if you were a little uncertain about Ginny as a character in terms of, ooh, is she a bad girl? Should we not be rooting for her? The fact that she is so willing to empathize with Jason as a person, right? Like how scary it must have been for him to have seen his mother get killed as a little boy, to have spent all those years living by himself. I think this is really endearing to our final girl. For sure, yeah. Yeah. 
and obviously it's kind of it's an interesting setup to what we get at the end right which is where she kind of she yeah. bests jason using psychology basically like mm-hmm. that's like a superpower right it's very cool it's also like the most introspective that some of these earlier films are because like we yes. talk a lot about how like, oh no one really grieves in slasher films when people die when their best friends die so this isn't exactly that but it's like oh like we're getting a moment of pathos from this character in a, in a franchise that doesn't really have a lot of pathos well mm-hmm. and, and i think it also lends i think compared to michael myers or certainly compared to freddy krueger there's something of a sympathetic side to jason too right like i don't know there's mm-hmm. something about him that people kind of like you know have warm fuzzy feelings over, right? towards towards jason sometimes don't they i think and i think yeah <laughs> there, you, you, i don't know there's something about him that is like you get where he's coming from a little bit you know <laughs> like given his backstory yeah yeah it's weird right because we should have a similar relationship to michael myers but because of wild dr loomis <laughs> constantly telling us that he is evil embodied behind those black eyes I don't think we look at him in the same way, whereas Jason I've always looked at as a slightly infantilized, like, you know, he's a hurt child who is trying to fight back against all these horny counselors who maybe have it coming. They really double down on that in the... um the awful Freddy versus Jason, don't they? Where they 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 kind of make <laughs> they kind of make Freddy the villain almost, right? And there's all those sequences mm-hmm. when like you see Jason reduced to like a little quivering boy, and and yeah. Freddy's like torturing him and stuff, you know. I think Freddy versus Jason is a really fun watch. I mean, like, it's, it's definitely not yeah. a good movie, but like I think it's a real fun time. <laughs> yeah, it's got some good sequences for sure. Sure. <laughs> I mean, if you're going to watch one Ronnie Yu slasher film, make it Bride of Chucky. Bride of Chuck yeah. Arts. There's a lot of fun to be had in some of the silliness of Freddy versus Jason. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So back at camp, we've got Mark revealing how he lost the ability to walk and why he's in the wheelchair. So he was in a motorcycle accident. And this is very endearing to Vicky to the point that she wants to fuck him. Well, his dick, she asked him, like, is everything, is it just your legs? So she's Mm -hmm. like, she basically asked him, does your dick still work? Yeah. Yeah. She, she is not being subtle, is she, with her, like, come on. Yeah. But here's the thing. So I actually, these are my two favorite characters outside of Jenny. Like these are my two favorite characters because I love watching their romance develop. Uh And honestly, it it, it is her asking him about his accident and even his dick where I'm like, oh, like, again, I love those type of like honest like conversations. Um, And it endears me to these characters so much to the point where I actually get genuinely upset when poor Vicky dies. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, she's she's a highly sympathetic character. I just think it's really, really important to acknowledge that we've got a disabled character in this film who is treated as a sexually viable Mm -hmm. candidate. Like the fact that these two have a romance, you know, we need to raise the question of, hey, can we do it? That's a valid question. But it's not like, oh, I'm fucking you out of sympathy or you're not as good a candidate as somebody like Scott. This is very much like... We have a genuine connection. Shall we get down to it? And I think that that is really fucking progressive for an early 80s movie. Yeah, I completely agree. I think that that there was a very, there was a very kind of lazy alternative option where they could have made his character like sad pathetic yeah or like, like what's his name in part three she- it's shelly is it is it shelly yeah. yeah they could have made him the kind of like the joke character almost or something you know and um it's yeah. nice that they didn't do that in this movie you're right well- and actually, I mean, this would, of course, come six years later, but um, Nightmare on Elm Street 3, Dream Warriors with the wizard right. kid. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Although he's not really sexually active as far as I can tell. <laughs> and, and that to me is the big difference about Mark. Like, I think it changes the game a little when you have an actor who looks this way. Mm-hmm. I think it, it changes the way that we look at a disabled character right. when we look at someone who looks like McBride does. Mm-hmm. And yeah, I I guess I just really appreciate that the film wanted to do something where we've got a disabled character but that doesn't make them less than they're not an object of ridicule or mockery and also they yeah can be a sexual person i also like that he wins the arm wrestle against jeff Uh uh-huh and then also he basically says you know the doctors don't think i'm never gonna don't think i'm ever gonna walk again but i disagree like i'm not Mm -hmm. gonna let this be the end of it and so i don't know it gives him like a drive It's, it's a tiny little character tidbit but like it gives him a drive that is just again refreshing to see yeah, mm-hmm. these even these tiniest little tidbits are something that we do not get in later Friday the 13th movies right. as well, you know? So yeah, we've got to take what we can get here. 
Yeah. <laughs> uh, meanwhile, Vicky is spraying her cooch with perfume, which I don't know. Do you don't like? <laughs> is that sanitary? Well, no. I'm just thinking about when he's eating her out later. Like, it's just going to taste like chemicals. Yeah, that don't do that. It's not great. <laughs> yeah. Although I do, I I do like the fact that she's like, okay, I'm wearing perfectly normal underwear, but I'm going to change into these like shit brown colored satin yes. panties. <laughs> we we had a whole long conversation about this on my podcast about this exact scene of her actually looking really really hot. She looks and great. And then going, I'm going to go change into something a little more comfortable and putting on this kind of woolly jumper and brown knickers. And we were like, mm-hmm. what's what's happening here? Do you like shit, Mark? Because I do. <laughs> She's like that guy at the Folsom Fair that was covered in shit. <laughs> that, oh that, that's her kink. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, to be clear, she still looks really, really good. Incredible. Yeah, it's just yeah. more the fact that it's like, I don't know. Girls, you don't need to look this way to appeal to people just to get fucked. Like, she, w- she would have looked better just walking in completely bottomless. <laughs> oh. Maybe she the put those brown. on. Yeah, maybe she put those on so that he would tear them off quicker. You know, just, just wow. let's just get rid of these. Ew! What the fuck are those? Take them off. Take them off. <laughs> 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 to be clear, would we like this better if they were any other color? <laughs> I, well, here's the thing, though. They don't look very fitting. They look no. kind of baggy on her. Exactly. Yeah they're, yeah, they're slightly too big and baggy as well. Yeah. I do think this is an 80s thing, though. It, it, because they're brown, though, it looks like she's kind of taken a dump on herself. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> uh, amazing. Uh. Anyway, the, this all builds to, unfortunately, not even a sex scene. Like, these poor characters don't even get to fuck. Sandra and Jeff, the two idiots, actually get to <laughs> consummate this relationship. But poor Vicky and Mark, they just get killed. And it's uh, very unceremonious. And poor Vicky is so traumatized. Like, she has to, she's the one that finds the bodies. Mm-hmm. Yeah. At least she never finds Mark's body, because that poor guy, his wheelchair is somewhere in the tree. <laughs> God, yeah, yeah. yeah. I will say, though, the sequence where we follow Jason's knife as he's advancing on Vicky after she sees Sandra Mm -hmm. and Jeff's bodies. Again, it's not like it's breaking new ground, but I just think it's a really interesting choice in how to frame this death sequence. We don't really see Vicky get killed. We see her get stabbed and then we kind of cut away from it. But this knife sequence seems really memorable to me. Well, and I think, again, you could argue it's homaging, again, that opening scene of Halloween, but I also get a lot of peeping Tom from this. Mm, um, yeah. yeah. But uh, I will say, so again, with these extended kill scenes, yeah, we do get a wide shot of Jeff and Sandra with the spear through them, and it's clearly a fucking, like, body mold of Jeff. Right. But with Sandra, it's not a gorier scene, but we hold in her reaction as she's looking at her knife wound a lot longer, so it's almost more... Like, it's not gorier, yeah, but it's more There's more upsetting. terror. Yeah. 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 Mm-hmm. I completely agree. I think there's a reason why this scene, again, feels very memorable compared to, like, some of the others in the series. And I think, yeah, it's that the visual uh, kind of choices, but also that there is some genuine fear and terror in this scene as well, which, again, so many Friday the 13th kills are like, something comes out of nowhere, stab, slash, and cut to the next scene, you know? Whereas yeah. this, this scene has a bit more than that. Yeah. There's tension. We're actually yeah. taking our time and building it up right even when uh vicky comes in and she sees the little smatter of blood stains on Mm -hmm. the sheets yeah and then that's when jason sits up which again feels very halloween to me but you're right mike it does feel like in other films we would have just slashed her and be done with it and move on to the next scene and here it feels like we're taking a little bit more time well and this is the first true glimpse of the potato sack on jason's head yeah I, i do even think his reveal like sitting up in this bed it's a really good jump scare yeah. yeah, yeah, I like it. It's great. The other thing I like is when we get to see just Vicky's legs getting dragged yes. down the stairs. Mm. Again, you don't need to put this in here because at the end of the day, it doesn't really matter what happens to the bodies. We always get, you know, a Jason art display at some point in these films where he's like, look what I can do, stack <laughs> bodies. But I... I think it's really unnerving to just watch her legs, her bloody legs get dragged down the stairs. Yeah. And I think you're right. Like, I think Steve Miner 
clearly is kind of a fan of horror and cinema right and you can see that in he's he, you know references to films like peeping tom and psycho mm-hmm. and there are obviously as well in this movie it's been discussed a lot but there are overt references slash rip-offs uh to um, bay, of uh, bay of blood yeah twitch oh, yeah. of the death nerve the jello the mario barva movie where almost shot for shot right the kind of the, the couple having sex that get like shish kebabbed and uh, right. the machete in the face as well. Like those are taken completely wholesale from Bay of Blood. Yeah. So fun. I wonder how many people would have gotten those references in the 80s. Like, again, thinking about how difficult it might have been to get your hands on an Italian import horror. Yeah. Well, and they claim that they had never seen a Bay of Blood. So this oh, is, according on. to them, this is not an intentional homage to that film. Um, oh. But who cares? Whatever. <laughs> yeah, that would be a very big coincidence if those two were, co- you know, if that was not yeah. an intent- intentional homage. Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So Ted, meanwhile, is dead drunk. So Ginny and Paul leave his ass at the bar and head back to camp. Oh, Ted died in a drunk driving accident. <laughs> That's what <laughs> happened there. Yeah. They did not bring him back to the cabin. They left him to find his own way home. <laughs> Oh, you don't think he just hooked up with that lady who was sitting next to him in front of those 20 bottles of beer? (laughs) (laughs) So we get back and obviously the cabin is in a complete state of disarray because no one has cleaned it up and we've been dragging bodies through it. So... So Ginny goes upstairs. She discovers the bloody bed, like a lot of blood on a this lot. bed. <laughs> yeah. But no bodies. The bodies have all been moved. And this is when she says, we are not fucking alone. And that is when Paul gets attacked and the chase begins. I mean, I tweeted this out yesterday, but I was like, I- I- I'm blaming myself for this too. But I'm really surprised that when you have these discussions, be it in person or on social media about best horror movie chase scenes, mm-hmm. this doesn't come up more. I mean, I guess you could argue maybe there's a, a few more breaks in it. So it's not one long chase scene, but I right. would argue it is. I would argue it is. Yeah, I would say so as well. And it is, I think it's one of the best sections of the movie right here. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 It, it helps that we're really only following Ginny. You know, Paul will jump in and out to not be any kind of help at all, <laughs> except for one moment. But this is Ginny's sequence. And even though we don't know that much about her, we know enough to care whether she lives or dies. She's obviously our final girl. But she's making smart decisions, which immediately endears her to me. And we are moving all over the fucking place. So this yeah. isn't she's cowering in a bathroom for 10 minutes as Jason stabs through or something. We're moving around and it's keeping it really visually interesting. So here's the thing. I don't know if you all agree with this or not, but like I think there's something that doesn't feel particularly cinematic about this chase scene. It maybe not quite a documentary feel, but it just feels quote unquote normal, if that real? makes any sense. Yeah. yeah, it feels real. Like we're there with her. I mean, I, 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 look, the, the first big one, you know, where she goes in the bathroom, she's holding the door, and she's mm-hmm. trying to, like, make sure the window's shut. And then we get that, again, amazing Fucking jump great. scare where he crashes through the window. So good. But I don't know. Yeah, there's just something that feels like I'm in this with her that makes it scarier. I agree. Yeah, I think there's, it's not stylized in any way, is it? Mm-hmm. And, there's, and that's what I mean about, I think there's something that these original few Friday the 13th movies have. There's a kind of like scritchy, scratchy, almost like found footage looking element to yeah. them in a weird way, you know, where it does feel like it's just some madman running around in the woods with a camera, right? And uh, I do, I like that element of this particular sequence. Yeah. It's a little bit more guerrilla filmmaking in a way. Yeah, Mm. it feels a little bit more unsafe for that reason, right? There's less gloss. Mm. But you're right, Joey. We're moving. So we're in a cabin here. Then we're in the woods. Then we're in the car. Then we're in the woods again. Then we go to another cabin with this pea shit. And then we're going (laughs) to the woods again. And then we're in the shack. Like, this is the last 20 minutes of this movie. (laughs) We're just on the move. But also, can we talk about the score in this sequence? Yes! This is so close to the Psycho score that I couldn't believe it wasn't. Yeah. Ooh, okay, okay. But it's effective, though. 
oh, it's so fucking good. It also feels like someone reached through the TV screen and cranked the volume on me because mm-hmm. it is almost overpowering. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Agreed. It's a lot. The score is a lot. I think it does a lot of the heavy lifting, in there, doesn't it? But it's uh, it's really it really works. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so yeah Ginny ends up taking cover under the bed this is when she pees Jason presumably sees it he climbs up onto a chair to get her so when she comes out he's there but uh, even though he's not particularly girthy he doesn't manage to not break the chair (laughs) Uh, this is when she attacks him with the chainsaw and I'm not gonna lie I would be curious to know if the people who made Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2 didn't look at this and say hey that's a precursor for stretch Mm. yeah I could see that I could absolutely see that definitely I mean it's a fleeting moment right like I actually thought that the chainsaw was going to play a larger role in this the first time I saw it, because mm-hmm. who brings out a chainsaw for one scene? <laughs> it's true. But, yeah. but it's nice, though, because we get to see Jason scared. And mm-hmm. I think that's also a really good facet to this whole sequence. Um, yeah. Yeah. Even though, I mean, I, I, we kind of skipped the car scene, but I do want to say, I, I love that where he's using a pitchfork. He, like, busts mm-hmm. through a door with this pitchfork, by the way. Yep. I don't know why he doesn't stab the driver's side of the seat when he's doing this, well, but whatever. Yeah. <laughs> but I think there's a really good shot, too, where the pitchfork comes through the roof of this car, but then his hand comes through as he's trying to grab for her, which I really, really like. Yeah. yeah. Gotta love a scene in a car, always, right? As well. Mm-hmm. Always. Yeah. yeah. Even the fact that we try multiple cars, because she tries her car, but of course, we already knew it wasn't going to start. Because... Chekhov's bad engine. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. So she has to hop in this yellow car and... Yeah, it it's just, it's fun, right? Like watching Ginny scramble around. And as you mentioned earlier, Trace, we're often seeing Jason either moving towards her or mm-hmm. sort of moving through the background. So even when he's not there, he's still such a presence. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And this is a running Jason too, so he, he can Ooh. move. He can move. So Ginny ends up eventually finding the murder shrine, which includes Mama Voorhees' head as well as her iconic blue sweater. And this is when we're using our pop psychology that we referenced earlier. So she throws on that sweater and impersonates Mom. What do we think of this? I love I this think sequence. It's great. Yeah, I love yeah. it. Do, you know, weirdly, going back to what I said earlier about how I watched these films out of order, I watched mm-hmm. part three before part two. And oh. as if you remember, but part three begins with this scene. Like it just right. it doesn't oh, even bother yeah. with little flashbacks. Like it just plays out this whole sequence. Yeah. <laughs> and I remember being very <laughs> confused run, by baby. this. I was like, this is a weird way to open a movie. I don't, who's this blonde chick and what's happening here? <laughs> what are we um, doing? Yeah. <laughs> but it is, it's such a it's such a great scene, I think. Yeah. And actually, we, I'm sorry, I just looked at the runtime for part three. Part three is 95 minutes, so a full 10 minutes longer than this movie. And so we don't even need to just redo the scene. <laughs> mm-hmm. No. I think it was one of the reasons why I disliked these films a little bit more than their other contemporaries, because it felt like we needed to do this, as though the previous film was so convoluted. And I was always frustrated that the new film couldn't find a better way to inform viewers how it goes. Yeah. Um. Or they just think we're dumb and forgot about it from the last year. Well, possibly that. Or or they're wondering, hey, people are going to walk into this not having seen the last movie, I guess. Mm-hmm. So we want to make sure that they're caught up and therefore give good word of mouth about the film. Because if they're confused, the word of mouth won't be good. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Sure. It's weird, though, because, like, not to get into part three, but, like, I just feel like this sequence doesn't really give you any information that you'd need no. to know going into part three. It's almost like they just thought it was a cool scene that they just wanted to show us again, I think. <laughs> Which is correct. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Out of context, I can't imagine what you would have thought just watching this. I, wait, why is the movie starting this way? Yeah. What does this mean? It's like, who's who's this final girl? Who's this guy with the sack on his head? Who's this mm-hmm. woman that he's pretending to be? And what's she got to do with anything? Like, what's happening? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Where am I right now? Yeah. Have I dissociated? Ooh. Did the edible kick in? <laughs> Three's the one with the handstand death too, right? Yes, that's the one. Oh, man. I can't, I can't hate a movie with that handstand death, man. I love that death. <laughs> 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 Okay, so Ginny kicks into mom mode where she is basically lambasting her son, telling him to kneel. She's buying herself time because she has, of course, managed to get her hands on this machete. Unfortunately, she moves moves. a little (laughs) to one side and he catches the real head in his vision. (laughs) So I I, I was like Jada Pinkett Smith in Scream 2 where I'm like, move, move! (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. 
<laughs> did you put on your your maroon sweater just because you're like oh of course <laughs> <laughs> looks like you're you're just in time looks like she's about to get it <laughs> indeed yes so jenny nearly bites it here this is when paul does the only useful thing he does in this entire fucking movie so he busts in manages to distract jason briefly and he buys jenny enough time so that we can shift into ultra slow mo as we slice jason in the neck and this is redoing the exact same kind of style of Mrs. Voorhees getting decapitated in that first movie. But again, the score when it's like, do, do, do. <laughs> yeah. It's so effective. It's so operatic, right? Yeah. <laughs> it is. It's big. They're going big, right? And I love it. And I love the slow mo. It, it's great. I mean, do y'all think she was aiming for his head and missed? Because I don't, I wouldn't have assumed this would have killed him. <laughs> no, uh, yeah. it, it definitely looks like it would have drawn blood, but I feel like maybe he could have put a quick hand on it and continued the chase, which I guess ironically he does. Yeah. So they end up pulling the bag off of Jason's head, but I love that they resist the inclination to show us what he looks like yet. It does then tease us that he will come back later because you're not going to pull a bag off of a creature's head and then not show us. Wouldn't it have been funny if, like, Paul vomited? Uh, and this is another thing I suppose that really differentiate it from from Halloween and Michael Myers, right? Is that they love in every movie to take off the mask and show the face, mm-hmm. you know? And they really love yeah. that, don't they? Yeah. I but feel like because it does feel like a whodunit in that moment, as though here's your killer, you're finally getting to see them. Except that in these cases, it's just oh, here's someone with a facial deformity. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I'm trying to think of what Jason. I think part seven is the one that has the best maskless Jason for me because that's also the one where he has the spine like that's uh that's exposed Mm, yes but i guess part four is okay too part four is pretty good i think part eight is the worst right with the manhattan um it's pretty bad i don't even think Uh, do they unmask him in the sewers yes and his face is all kind of melting it's it's not great Uh, yeah yeah. and then he becomes a child because that's what chemicals do (laughs) 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 see at least in this film we're kind of using proper psychology i mean proper in quotation I mean, marks but yeah no i mean but again as you as we have said like it, it shows Ginny's resourcefulness and even though it's kind of dumb like it makes for a good climax mm-hmm. well i like that we've got the action we're coming to expect or that we're we're looking for in these movies but also we're showing her intellect right like her ability to reason and use logic to get herself out of this like i like that we get both a bit of downtime but also some some bloodletting yeah for sure yeah so Ginny and Paul end up making their way back to the main cottage because, of course, they believe that the danger is over. Fools. <laughs> and, well, sort of. Paul knows enough to give Ginny the pitchfork, so she's just there, braced, waiting for something to burst through this door as he stands next to it. I love that he basically uses her as bait. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Stand by this window real quick. <laughs> So this is, of course, the Muffin reveal. It's the revelation. The dog we saw earlier is not Muffin. Muffin is still alive. Oh, super cute. And then we get the best fucking jump scare in the entire film. I think what makes this work just as well as the jump scare from the first movie is every time I watch it, I can never remember when the jump scare happens. Yes. Nope. Yeah, it really takes it. Like with this movie and the first one, right? It really takes its time. It really sits in that moment before it gives Mm -hmm. you the jump. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, we don't really get to see what happens because we're back into a bit of slow-mo, but we do get to see what Jason looks like without the mask on. And it's brief but effective. And then Ginny gets dragged out and we once again fade to white and we pick back up the next morning as she's being loaded off into the ambulance, demanding to know where Paul is. And we get a quick little zoom in on Mama Voorhees' severed head. That's the end of the movie. So, Mm. again, Mandela effect. I do have a distinct memory of watching this on TV and those heads' eyes open up. I was sure the eyes were going to open as well. Yeah. Okay. So... That was how the film was supposed to end, but then oh, Steve, okay. Steve Miner removed the scene out of the final cut because he decided Good. that it would make the film's conclusion too silly. Yeah. And apparently this footage of this alternate ending has never been released, but you know how like huh. with Halloween 2, there's like the TV edit of it? I really wonder if somehow, somewhere, some way, like... It got out. 
Uh, yes, because I, I just, I have such a distinct memory of this head's eyes opening up, but again, maybe it's the Mandela effect. <laughs> yeah, mm. I am exactly the same, Trace. Like, I, I was waiting for those eyes to open, um, even on today's rewatch, and I've seen this film about 80 times at this point, and I was like, what? <laughs> yeah. Well, do you think it's just because we know so much about the production of these films, because we've got such an in-depth documentary, we've heard people talk and theorize about them for decades at this point, like, even though... Full confession, Friday is not my favorite slasher series. That would still be a nightmare on Elm Street. Mm. It just feels like we know so much about the big three in the 80s that, you know, there's wild speculation. There's all these different cuts. And it just feels like we've ingrained certain pieces like trivia and alternate cuts to the point that we think they're real. Yeah. 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 I think it could be that for sure. Yeah. But nevertheless, uh, listeners, let us know. Do you also have a distinct memory of these eyes opening up on one of your TV viewings? <laughs> it's just we're pushing in on them for so long, you think something's going to happen. Which I almost like because it feels restrained, right? And so I, mm-hmm. when we do just kind of go to black, it's like, oh, okay. Yeah, the movie's done. You're safe now. Yeah, you're bracing yourself for something that doesn't come. And so I almost, which is the exact opposite of what these movies do exactly Mm -hmm. that it's a weirdly low-key ending actually isn't it yeah Mm -hmm. yeah because normally we'd go for a final scare i i actually really like the fact that it is a bit restrained yeah yeah Uh absolutely agreed but that's uh that's friday the 13th part two well i mean so mike uh as the guest of honor what, what final thoughts on this film I think it's great. Like, I actually think in some ways this is like the quintessential Friday the 13th movie. It's like if I mm-hmm. if I wanted to show somebody in a nutshell what is Friday the 13th, I think I would maybe show them this movie. Like, it kind of ticks all of the beats, doesn't it? Apart from the fact that it doesn't feature the hockey mask. Right. Right. Everything else feels like it, it gives you exactly what you'd imagine of a kind of low-budget, early 80s Friday the 13th mm-hmm. slasher movie, and it's done well. I think it is... I think it is, like, top three friday the 13th for me for sure like i think it's a really really strong entry yeah Mm -hmm. so wait what are the other two then mike i'm just thinking about that now in my head i think it would be (laughs) oh shit i shouldn't have said it out loud i think it would be parts one and part four i think it's yeah i think i think one two and four are probably my my three favorites like i said i'm a really big fan of the early years of the friday the 13th movies particularly i think and then six would be close behind that yeah Mm -hmm. yeah so out of the latter entry six is your best of those Yes, for sure. Yeah. Not a big fan of Seven. Uh, I think it's a really cool idea that it's a bit of a wasted opportunity. And then, again, part eight, a really fun idea that isn't as executed as well as you want it to be, I think. you know. Oof. My thing with eight, and like it, it, that's second bottom of the franchise for me. I even have it below Jason Goes to Hell, because at least Jason Goes to Hell is like just wacky. Uh, yeah. Jason Goes to Hell is amazing, so fuck <laughs> you very much. Yeah. Oh, Jason Goes to Hell is a movie. Um, yeah, no, I, I go, so again, two and six alternate between my number one and two spots a lot, but then it's final chapter. Then I do have part three, but we haven't mentioned the remake at all. I actually mm. really like the remake of this film, um, because I do think it is a loving ode to these first four films. Yeah. Wow. Do you know what? I should give it another watch. I've only seen it once in the theatre when it first came out, whenever that was, 2009, mm. and I, I hated it at the time. I thought it was really boring, um, but I should, gi- I should give it another go. Yeah. yeah. So we marathoned these with some of our friends, and one of our friends, he was like, fuck that remake. He hadn't seen it since the, since the theatres in 2009. He was like, all those characters are horrible, blah, 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 blah. Yeah. I mean... That's what we do in 2000s horror, but you know. yeah, exactly. <laughs> but, of course, yeah. So, but of course, you know, so we finished our marathon with the remake, and by the end of it, he was like, "Shit, that was a lot more fun than it's I remember good. it being." <laughs> Here's okay. the thing: I think it had been so long since we had gotten a new one, it wasn't giving us exactly what we expected, and that opening is Great. kind of confronting, right? Mm-hmm. So you get out of it, and I think you've got to reconcile with the fact that it's not what you expected. But I will say, it plays much better on a rewatch. Yeah, okay, I agree. So let us know, Mike. <laughs> yeah, maybe I should. Maybe I should. Yeah, I, I, I lump it in with the Nightmare on Elm Street 2010, and I'm just. Oh God! I'm no, not, I'm not no, a fan no, no, of no, these no. movies. <laughs> that that movie is uninspired and boring, and made by people who hate the Nightmare on Elm Street franchise. <laughs> right. Except for exactly. those poor actors, that fantastic cast that yeah. are stranded in a terrible movie. Oh, it's but just Friday the Thirteenth, at least. I, I, again, I think Marcus the Spell, like that, and Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Like, I think those are great remakes. But yeah, I just I think you can feel the love for the franchise in that remake, even though I will say I do think the weakest part of it is the kills. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's such a shame that I mean, like we know. Speaking of Steve Miner, that's the way I feel about Halloween H two O. I kind of feel like it's a it's a great movie, just not a very good horror or slasher movie. Yes, um, right. <laughs> I would no, I, I would agree. I, yeah. would, but I think the Lori arc and all of her PTSD is better <sighs> so and like is is better than anything in that new trilogy we got. Oh, hundred yeah. percent. I think like, uh, and I know this is a whole other conversation, but I think like I think H two O and and twenty eighteen H four O are like. <laughs> uh, they're, they're kind of polar opposites in what their strengths are, I think. Because, like, 100%. Uh, H2O yes. is a great Laurie Strode film, not a very good horror film. I think David Gordon Green made a quite a fun slasher film, but it's a really yeah. bad Laurie Strode film, I think, in 2018, you know? Yeah. Mm-hmm. But, um, all right, Joe, Joe, any more, any final thoughts from you on this? Uh, I'll just say this is such a pleasant surprise for me, having, again, not seen this in quite some time. This movie was just really fun and well done. I'd forgotten how good Minor directs this, and that was a joy. That score is loud as fuck, and so it's doing so, so much in this movie. And yeah, you know, Ginny, classic, all-timer. A fucking man. Yeah, well... Before we announce what we're covering next week, uh, Mike, first, thank you so much for coming on to discuss this at this spookiest of seasons. But let everyone know, where can they find you and your podcast on social media? Oh, thank you so much. It's been so much fun. So I, I do the Evolution of Horror podcast, which you can find wherever you get your podcasts. We're on Twitter, X, whatever, <laughs> uh, Instagram, all the blue sky oh, threads, yeah. all the fucking socials. You can find me any, anywhere. Um, we're doing a series on home invasion movies at the moment, which you guys have both featured on, mm-hmm. which has been really fun. But we are also dropping a little bonus Friday the 13th episode as well ah, this month. Because there we it's go. October, oh. it's Friday the 13th. We got our patrons to decide which two Friday the 13th movies uh, they wanted to hear discussed. And we they voted for part two and part four so oh. there you go so we'll, there we go we'll be uh, we, we've covered that also over on evolution of horror but yeah you can find that wherever you get your podcasts awesome well if you want to get in touch with us you can reach us on twitter and instagram at horror queers or shoot us an email at horror at gmail.com find us on letterbox to keep track of all the films we've covered go to our youtube channel to check out our interviews with various horror filmmakers and tune in once a month to hear us talk about our most anticipated horror films for that month if you want to connect with other listeners please join our facebook group if you have a moment, please rate and review us on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. Hey, it's October. This is a great time to do that. Please go leave us a five-star review. <laughs> sure. Uh, if you want even more content, please support the show by becoming a patron at patreon.com slash horrorqueers. If you subscribe today, you will get about 265 hours of Patreon content, including this month's new episodes on It Lives Inside, No One Will Save You, Totally Killer, Saw 10, Exorcist Believer, and our audio commentary for the month on John Carpenter's original Halloween. Yeah. Yeah. But, uh, Joe. Mm-hmm. Next week is a first-time watch for me. What are we covering? Oh, boy. Okay. Well, we're going to gate up to the nth degree for better and worse. Yeah. We're going to check out the 25th anniversary of Apt Pupil. Yes. Um, Stephen King adaptation directed Mm -hmm. by noted predator Brian Singer. So again, proceed at your own risk, I guess, is maybe the phrase I want to (laughs) use. Yeah, thankfully, we've got some Ian McKellen to balance it out. But, uh, you know, also Nazism. Yes, I, I was, I'm so excited. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> Yay, Nazis! Um, anyway, but yes, until next week, everyone, we can cross out Friday the 13th, part two. Indeed, and cross out horror queers. Ah, Atlas Avenue, a long stretch of road that encompasses everything the city of Kennet Heights has to offer. Neon lights, traffic, crime, the hustle and bustle of everyday life, and the craziest of characters. My office was above it all. My name is James Locke, and I'm a P.I. Hello, Mr. J. How the hell you doing today? Good, Edith. Nearly every year I have a new case. New people to meet, new clues to discover, and new problems to solve. But I do it the old-fashioned way. No technology. Nothing post-1950. Hell, I don't even listen to podcasts, but you should. Atlas Avenue Beat is a spoof of the film noir genre with goofy characters, tons of wordplay, and non-stop raunchy humor. There's also three whole seasons out right now with more on the way. 
Just search for Atlas Avenue Beat wherever you listen to podcasts or visit us online at bloody.fm.